So we're going to move into the last panel session now. Uh, the, the topic uh, here is disentangling discrimination. And uh, today, uh, Kathy Fitch, who has been graciously co-hosting with me, she is going to serve as session chair for this last uh, uh, panel of the day. So Kathy joined IPAMS in the mid-1990s as a undergraduate research assistant and has been a vital contributor ever since. Today, uh, as many of you probably know, Kathy wears a lot of hats at ISRD, uh, serving as its associate director and the director of the administrative team. She's the associate director of IPAMS, and uh, she is the executive director of the Minnesota Research Data Center, which is our federal statistical research data center where we can get access to uh, restricted versions of the um, NHIS, ACS, the decennial censuses. Uh, Kathy is PI of multiple IPAMS grants and a research scientist studying marriage and family from the early 1900s until today. So uh, join me in welcoming Kathy. Uh, and uh, again, without her hard work this week either, we would not have had trivia questions. We would not have had a decent flow between sessions. So thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Dave. All right. So our uh, first, and I'll, I'm going to move over here and we can start getting set up easily. I'm going to introduce um, Francisca Antman, who is professor in the economics department at the University of Colorado Boulder, also a faculty affiliate in the population program at the CU Population Center and research fellow at the Institute of the, for the Study of Labor. She is a development and labor economist with special interests in, in international migration, human capital investments, the construction of ethnic and ra racial identity, and economic development in historical perspective. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And I want to thank Kathy, and I want to thank uh, really everybody at IPAM, Sarah and Steve, and Every IPAMS user help that's ever answered my question. I was just thinking of, of Kari, who's answered many of my IPAMS questions. And I want to say thank you. Congratulations to IPAMS on these 30 years. And as a faculty member that I have, I've started so many students, graduate students and undergraduate students on IPAMS and it is a tremendous resource to faculty members and to students alike. So in, in this paper um, that I'm very pleased and grateful to, to present here, thank you for the invitation. This is co-authored work with uh, my colleague at, at CU Denver, Brian Duncan, and who is also a very uh, heavy user of IPAMS and where we are, are really grateful for the service. So in this paper, we are going to be um, expanding our work that we have now several papers on basically endogenous racial identity, and we're gonna be expanding it to ethnic identity, and in particular, the identification choices of people of Hispanic and Mexican ancestry, and we're linking it with actual incentives to identify. So that's kind of what our um, innovation in this paper is, and looking in particular at anti-immigrant sentiment as uh, evidenced by uh, the passage of this Proposition 187 in, in California, and I'll talk about it in a moment. And I should say that this is this is preliminary and it is uh, a work in progress. So uh, your feedback is is most welcome. OK, so in in recent years, we know that many elections have centered on stoking racial and ethnic divisions. So in this paper, we're going to consider how racial and ethnic identity choices might respond to an increasingly political climate. So this is really uncertain because you might think that individuals from ethnic or racial minorities might actually be less likely to identify with a racial or ethnic a minority group if they fear that they might be negative consequences from it. So discrimination, for instance. But at the same time, individuals from ethnic or racial minorities may, might actually be more likely to identify with their group if this climate has actually raised their consciousness surrounding race. So we're going to look at uh, the example of this passage of California Prop 187, which is really in, in the political science literature, I'm an economist, but in the political science literature is really th thought of as this kind of case study for examining really this rising consciousness of voter participation of the Hispanic Latino community in California. And we are going to examine it as this case study where we can learn something more broadly about racial and ethnic identity identity. 
So just some background, some quick background, Proposition 187, it was also known as the Save Our State Initiative. It called for denying public social health and education services to unauthorized immigrants. It's one of the, really the first of these kinds of initiatives that you may be familiar with in other states, um, but it's really one of these you know, most well-known ballot measures that was widely seen to be anti-immigrant. Uh, state and local officials were basically called on to, would have been uh, called on to investigate and report anyone suspected of being in the U.S. Uh, in violation of immigration laws. There was a very big focus on schools and what school officials would have been required to do. So uh, they would have been basically required to verify the legal status of students and their parents and guardians. So there was a, a, a very strong consciousness, basically, that this was going to change the environment in public schools in California. I am also uh, from California and was in public schools at this time. So um, it was widely seen to plausibly discriminate against the Latino community in California, regardless of status, because again, it was seen to basically you know, require people to verify their status and who would be the most likely basically to be um, suspected of you know, potentially being in the, in the country in violation of, of immigration laws. So here we're going to ask whether individuals of Latino Hispanic ancestry were less likely to identify uh, as Hispanic or Latino as a result. And again, it's really uncertain because it's also really associated with this larger consciousness raising that is happening among the Latino community in California at this time. So in the political science literature and, and really in the, the broader you know, political discussion surrounding the trajectory of California, which many of you may know, you know was uh, you know, also had a, a strong history of Republican uh, leadership at the time, but it's really credited with, with uh, changing the political course of California, right? So in, in the days leading up to the election, there's gonna be a November election. There are many protests that are being held, again, because it's really identified as basically uh, potentially affecting school environments. There were school walkouts, school boycotts, and it really included a lot of newly organized uh, Latino students. So it passed by a wide margin in November 1994, but it faced significant court challenges and it was ultimately found to be unconstitutional. So we're not really looking at what happens because this, this came into law. We're really looking at the event as you know, suddenly you're in your community and you realize, you might realize it's going to, it's, it's going to pass really surprisingly overwhelmingly. And suddenly you realize that actually you live in a community that may actually, you know, support these kinds of initiatives. So what kind of, what does that um, tell you, you know, about, about your community and how does that change your, your, um, your racial or ethnic identification choices? Okay, so that's what we're going to be looking at here. This is just a map of California and very, there is variation in the vote share across California and we're going to be exploiting that in our analysis here. Uh, but you can see a lot of it is, is, is very heavily supportive of, of the initiative. And we're going to link it with Brian Duncan, my, my co-author, and I have contributed to this literature on ethnic attrition. So Duncan and Trejo, uh, Steve Trejo and, and Brian Duncan are, uh, you know, one of the leaders in, the, uh, leaders in, this, in this literature, their, their paper um, that documents really selective ethnic attrition. So ethnic attritors are individuals who, who do not uh, identify with, you know, a, a, a racial or ethnic group, but actually have that ancestry. So in this case, we're looking at Hispanic ethnic attrition. In particular, we're going to be looking at the Mexican uh, group because they're a, a very large share of, of California Hispanics. So I also have some papers uh, with Duncan and Trejo looking at this, and you do see this kind of pattern of selective health, health ethnic attrition that's also been documented in education and on other margins. In my own work with Brian Duncan, we have really tried to link this with actual incentives. So as opposed to just looking at the correlates of ethnic attrition, who are the groups that are most likely to attrit out of a Hispanic Latino identity, we're actually looking at uh, broader racial groups and actually linking those patterns of, of racial and ethnic attrition with incentives to identify. So we have a paper uh, in the Review of Economics and, and Statistics looking at the affirmative action bans that arguably you know, changed the, the uh, 
the perceived penalties to identifying with certain uh, racial groups. And we find actually that Asian and Asian Americans are actually more likely to identify after states ban affirmative action. And we also have a more recent paper uh, in the Journal of the European Economic Association, uh, where we look at actually Native American, American Indians, and we look at their, their patterns of increasing. We've seen basically patterns of, of increases in uh, identification for American Indian uh, tribes in particular, and we link that with the opening of casinos. But we find this curious result that actually there's an increase in the probability that individuals with American Indian ancestries identify as Native American, but a decrease in the probability that people with no documented American Indian ancestry self-identify. So those two things are happening that is correlated with this expansion of, of uh, tribal uh, casinos. And we argue, set up just a small com conceptual framework uh, and argue that this is really consistent with self-identification responding to economic motivations as well as social stigma surrounding that. But we see this, this two patterns of result and I mention it now because we're gonna see similar pattern um, in this work here. Okay, so here we're looking at anti-immigrant sentiment as measured by local support, county support for Proposition 187 and looking at how that might have changed patterns of ethnic identification for Hispanic Latinos in California. We're gonna use the vote share for Prop 187 at the county level. That's gonna be our proxy for anti-immigrant sentiment. And we're gonna look at changes over time in Hispanic Latino identification for people based on their ancestry and the very recent results that we have just added uh, also look at generational status. So we're gonna be using both the census and the CPS, the current population survey, to look at both of those. And we find some, some interesting results. So thus far, we there have been really no papers that have con connected changes in Hispanic Latino identity with changes in incentives to identify um, as Hispanic or Latino. So this would be this would be the first paper to really connect that political discourse with that, that kind of endogenous ethnic choice. Our preliminary results suggests that anti-immigrant sentiment, again, is measured by this county level vote share uh, for in support of, of Prop 187 did affect ethnic identification patterns. We see a reduced willing to, willingness to identify as Mexican origin for individuals with Mexican ancestry, that's using the census, and individuals with stronger, more observable ties to Mexican identity as demonstrated by generational status. We'll, we'll see that uh, in the current population uh, survey that I, I just mentioned. And at the same time, we find an increased willingness to identify as Mexican origin, again, consistent with this, this consciousness raising of, of Hispanic Latinos in California that's occurring at this time. Uh, we find this increasing increased willingness to identify for individuals with no Mexican ancestry listed, but who we think may have some vague sense of Mexican ancestry and individuals with weaker latent ties to Mexican identity. Again, we're going to see that with the CPS uh, results that allow us to, to actually see uh, the third generation. Okay, so we have distinct motivations in response to this. Okay, so we're going to use the census. I, um, you're all familiar with this, IPMS USA, uh, the 1990 and the 2000 census, it's pretty far from that 1994 period. We're only gonna look at US born individuals and we're going to leverage information from the ancestry question as well as the Hispanic origin question. The CPS data, that's going to help us identify immigrant generation and identify impacts on people born in Mexico people, uh, US born individuals with at least one parent born in Mexico, that's a second generation and third generation, US born children with two US born parents and at least one grandparent born in Mexico. The CPS is gonna be a much smaller sample, but it is going to be this, this similar story consistent with, with our results from the census, which is of course much, much larger. As you all know, race and Hispanic origin are asked separately on these surveys. So we are gonna be looking at in particular Hispanic and Mexican origin that will focus. It, ancestry is another separate question on the census. I'm gonna skip over these descriptive results. And I'm going to show you the specification here where basically the outcome is whether you identify as Mexican origin 
And on the right hand side, we have an interaction between essentially whether it's after uh, prop the, the passage of Prop 187. So that's the indicator variable there. In the census, it's 2000, with the CPS is just going to be 1995. And it's interacted with county level support for Proposition 187. Uh, we have, you know, some just some uh, control variables, gender, age, uh, and then we are going to separate estimate everything separately by ancestry. And this is the picture I want to show you. So I'm going to focus just on the no Mexican ancestry and the only Mexican ancestry. Those are like the extreme um, results there. And a darker color means that they are moving into uh, Mexican identification. And you can see in the picture there, those with no Mexican ancestry, it's getting darker because those with no Mexican ancestry look like they're more likely to identify as Mexican. And that's correlated with that uh, you know, support for Proposition 187. And over here in the only Mexican ancestry specification, we're actually seeing less likely to identify. And that's what you see in the regression results. Again, you see these two different responses based on ancestry. So in terms of the CPS results, I'll go to those since I'm, I'm and I'm going to focus on the third generation results. That's where we see a lot of this, the same kind of pattern here. So this is for children. And what we see as that is that responses of third generation Mexican Americans to local support for Prop 187 are really mediated by their ties to Mexican ancestry. For those with stronger ties, we see a decreased willingness to identify. So here you can see that's Mexican only on your dad's side, for instance. So that would be, you know, correlated with potentially having an observable marker like uh, a Hispanic last name, for instance. So we see negative coefficients there. For those on who might have more latent Mexican identity, Mexicans on, on the mother's side only, then we see the positive effect consistent with this kind of consciousness raising effect coming from that uh, response to that initiative. Okay, so uh, preliminary results suggest this anti-immigrant sentiment here as measured by county level vote share really affected ethnic identification patterns. We see a reduced willingness to identify as Mexican origin for those individuals with Mexican ancestry as given by the census and individuals with stronger, more observable ties to Mexican identity at the second generation. That's what you see as well, who have a stronger tie um, to um, you know, Mexican identity. Typically in, in other studies on ethnic attrition, you really see ethnic attrition occur at the third generation or higher. And that's what we see also when this kind of um, change takes place, where we see an increased willingness to identify as Mexican origin for individuals with no Mexican ancestry listed, but who may have some vague sense of Mexican ancestry from the census. And also we see from the CPS individuals with weaker latent ties to Mexican identity. They are uh, Mexican and other ancestry. They have Mexican only on their mother's side, so they may be less likely to have a Hispanic uh, name. So to our knowledge, this is really the first paper to connect changes in, in Hispanic Latino identity with changes in incentives to identify, and really the first to talk about ethnic identity choices and link them with uh, political discourse. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. I'm really happy uh, to introduce Dr. J. Mag Carbia, and uh, Dr. Carbia is an assistant professor here at the University of Minnesota uh, in the School of Health Division on Health Policy and Management. As a health services researcher, Dr. Carbia scholarship aims to identify how structural and institutional forms of discrimination contribute to per persistent health inequities. Um, so thank you for that introduction, Kathy. So today I'll be sharing work from a paper uh, recently published in Population, Place, and Space by myself and Dave Hacker that leverages the 1900-1910 complete count census um, to look at the effect of racial residential segregation on child mortality. Um, I've seen a few of the other presenters give their IPAM's backstory, so I think it's important to situate this work. Um, so Dave and I started this project four or five years ago, so pre-pandemic when the world was all rosy, um, when I 
was in the Minnesota Population Center's Population Studies Program. That was before I was in their Population Health Training Program. So um, I took a seminar, a fertility seminar with Dave, um, learning foundational demographic methods, being that I'm a public health researcher, being introduced to demography, um, and really one, learning about life tables, learning about fertility schedules and thinking, how does this relate to my research interest um, um, around racism and the impact of racism on maternal and child health outcomes? So that's really kind of the impetus for this paper and thinking about how to leverage historical data to understand the structural causes of inequities. So some motivating questions here. Um, I, at the time, and am always reading work around um, perinatal health outcomes and child mortality. So thinking about, here's a ton of literature that has looked at these structural factors in the late 20th century and into the 21st century, but how do we leverage historical data to better understand the, the trajectory and the impact of racism throughout our national history, right? We know that racism's impacts haven't only been felt in the post-Civil War era. We know that is it has existed since the inception of our country. How do we measure this impact through the data that we have available? Um, and also thinking about the early 20th century as a really different context from um, the context that a lot of the current literature is situated in. So how do we incorporate the factors that we've already seen discussed earlier, like lead exposure or water quality issues or respiratory diseases and its impact on child health? How do we account for that and at the same time also examining the unique impact that racism has on these health outcomes? Um, I think some insights from Dave and his work as a historical demographer, also thinking about positive and negatives. I know Dave has done a lot of work around ethnic enclaves. So thinking about this concentration of racial groups and the potential positive, but also negative effects. Do we see similar trends when we look at black, white differences in racial segregation? Are there some benefits? For example, black residents are visiting black businesses. There's an economic component to that, or is it solely negative? We know from the public health literature, there's concentrated poverty. Are we seeing more of those effects or are we seeing some positive effects due to this concentration of racial groups as well? Um, and, and trying to understand, again, the impact of this form of structural inequity on the large disparities that we see in child mortality in the early 20th century. And I've kind of given a lot of in-depth um, overview about what the background and the existing literature says. Specifically in public health, we identify residential segregation as a fundamental cause of health inequities, right? So if we take away all the other stuff, we control for all the things. We still know, um, as Robert Wood Johnson has fantastically coined for us, where you live, work, and play really defines your health and your health outcomes. Also with perinatal and maternal and child health studies, we know that especially for folks racialized as black, residential segregation has dramatic impacts on both the rates of um, low birth weight infants, preterm birth, but also infant mortality. And so this is when we compare folks who are racialized as black who live in high segregation areas versus those who live in low segregation areas. And overall in the literature, what we see is that being um, a, a white identified person doesn't necessarily confer the same impact of residential segregation. So it doesn't matter if you're in a high or low segregation area, if you're white, generally speaking. Um, and again, to this point, which I think is the novelty of our paper, a lot of this work has focused on the late 20th century. Um, and um, and not really looked at how these trends appear in the early, early 20th century. What we identify as the limitations of this research, one, um, it's been really difficult to create good child mortality measures. And I think the method that we use is novel and really fun and gives a good um, approximation of child ages that allows us to not only say this person experienced a child death, but also allows us to say this child died between the ages of zero and five, which is really indicative of environmental health concerns and an early childhood mortality. Um, second, a lot of limited sample size issue. Um, if we look at the folks who have done this um, historical child mortality work like Preston and Haynes, they're working with much limited samples. And what Dave and I um, use are two complete count samples that allow for millions of samples versus I think Preston and Haynes in fatal years had a total black sample, um, about 2000 black mothers on which they based a lot of their analyses. And so we have millions and millions of black children and, and white children as well with which this analysis is based on. And lastly, um, a lot of the race, the residential segregation measures we have are very spatial in nature, right? So we're looking at entire cities or entire counties and saying, here's the number of black people and here's the number of white people. And while that's useful to say there are more black people or there are less white people, 
um, beyond the composition of a neighborhood is the spatial arrangement of people and really trying to think about where people are located and what that tells us about how people interact. Um, it's a, it's a, ba a bit of overselling, but I like to think about our segregation measure of telling the story of, the story of racism, the lived experience of it, in that we see the social patterning of neighborhoods and the influence that that has and the story that dealt and that tells that we usually don't get when we look at these broad spatial measures that just tell us there's X number of people in this space. So the overview of, of the study, what we do is model the relationship between segregation and child mortality. We use a series of logistic regressions looking at probability of death under five as our outcome. We estimate um, the mortality of all white and black children born in the five years before each census. So children born presumably 1895 to 1900 and then 1900, um, um, sorry, 1905 to 1910, um, using probabilistic imputation me um, methods. Um, and lastly, we construct residential segregation measures for rural and urban areas in the South. And we limit our sample to the South. Um, and I think this comes up later, just because of the time period and where we see the most black white diversity. So data and measures, I've hit on it already. We're looking at the 1900 and 1910 complete count censuses. Um, and for myself, starting this project the day previous, I had done a lot of qualitative data. So it was a huge <laughs> learning curve working with samples of under a hundred people to working with these large full count samples with millions of people and thinking about um, what that means. And again, we limit to the three Southern census regions. So West Central, East, East South Central and Mid Atlantic, South, South Atlantic, apologies. Um, and so in our quest to measure child mortality, um, we use these two census, um, these two censuses because they ask mortality questions in a way that we don't see in other um, in other other years. One, um, all married women are asked, um, how many children have you ever given? How many children have you given birth to? So how many children born? And the number of those children surviving. And in most of the historical work looking at child mortality, these are the variables used to decide whether or not a person has experienced a child death. Um, while these questions are useful because they exist and we don't have them in other surveys, they they fall short in that we don't know when these children died, right? So I could be a 50-year-old woman that says I, I've had eight children and two of them are still alive, but we don't know exactly when those children died, were those child deaths, was that a child that um, was employed and then died, et cetera. So we don't really know when these child deaths happened. Um, so instead of using these measures uh, that only allow us to tell if a child death occurred, um, we um, reconstruct complete birth histories using the complete count census and the partial um, birth histories provided. Um, and I kind of alluded to this already, but this is an example of how um, um, we sp specifically, Dave, uh, took on the task of reconstructing birth histories. So here from the census is a woman who is 48 and reports having eight children. Um, and we know of those children, six are currently resident children and two um, are are missing from the census record. We know one is alive and a non-resident child, but the other is deceased. And so how do we figure out who these two children are and what their potential ages are? Um, and this is a process that's done through um, imputation and using life tables to think about fertility schedules specifically and what we know about birth spacing to think about um, we know approx the approximate ages and births of all these other children based on what we know about fertility in this time period. We can use imputation to approximate the age and um, approximate time of birth of these two missing children. And I feel like my boxes got really wonky up here, but using this imputation and there's a lot more, there could have been more slides added, but what we're allowed to do using this method is these two missing children, we can um, use these measures to identify that our deceased child was approximately 21 at age of death based on the spacing of this, this mother's other children and that the non-resident child, again, based on the spacing um, and fertility schedule of women during this time period was approximately 27. Um, so that's, I think that's fun. I hope you think it's fun too. Um, but that's only one part of the puzzle, right? So we get this really good count that allows us to understand um, early childhood mortality, but how do we measure segregation, especially in this post-war pe post period? Um, 
1900 and 1910, we often think about segregation as this big neighborhood segregation, right? So if you've been to an economics lecture or public health lecture, lecture when we talk about um, residential segregation, what we often talk about is the difference um, in neighborhoods and neighborhood compositions that's usually due to redlining and things like that. But how do you measure segregation before redlining? How do you measure segregation, um, especially in the South, when you still have close physical proximity between black and white households? Um, and this picture is here thinking about this um, to get us thinking about the census as a social process, because during this period, enumerators are often people who lived in these neighborhoods, right? So they lived in these neighborhoods, they understood the racial conventions, they understood how communities interacted. And so um, um, scholars and methodologists argue that by looking not just at the number of people, but how households are enumerated, so the physical um, location of people in the census by their enumerators tells us something about the social positioning and patterning. Specifically, what you see in the South is a lot of black and white households that are on the same street, but you have white people on the front street and black people on the, on the back, and you see that replicated by census enumerators. So they'll go to all the white households and then go in the black, back alleys, although these households are on the same street, technically. So it's kind of a social representation. Um, in the data, we see the social representation of race within this space. And um, that's one way to measure segregation. Um, really belaboring the point here, but tra traditional segregation measures often just say, there's X number of households in this entire group here. And all we can tell when we use measures like dissimilarity is that um, there are some red households in this group of blue, but what this doesn't tell us is what's the difference between each of these four subunits, right? So we're not getting that information. However, when we use this, um, nearest neighbor or sequence index of segregation, um, looking at enumeration districts and looking at continuous numbers of racial groups in the record, we get a much different um, get a much different story than we get by just using these general measures like dissimilarity or isolation. Um, so our analytic universe is really large. We have about 7 million um, individuals in both, across both senses. Um, we use a series of models um, in this work. Um, I There's a lot of data. There's a lot of work that went into this um, and I'm already almost done with my time. So what I'm presenting today is the complete model and I'm only presenting the numbers for proportion black, which tells us approximately the number of black people within an enumerator enumeration district and also our sequence index of segregation. So this walking path measure of segregation. Um, there's also in the full paper, which you can read online. Also, we look at traditional measures like dissimilarity and isolation. And um, in the end, we can talk about the fact that when we use only these larger traditional measures, we don't get the same story. But when we use this new sequence index of segregation, we see a different story than the traditional me measures that we've been using to measure segregation. So um, child mortality in this era, what we see is a similar story, unfortunately, to what we see today. Black children had about two times um, the risk of death and rate of death as their white counterparts. So we know, especially in the region we're looking at, so black infants had a much greater risk of death than their white counterparts. When we look in rural areas, we and looking at proportion black in an enumeration district, there's a 22% increase in the risk of experiencing a child death. Um, when we look at um, black children specifically living in a high um, high black neighborhood, is associated with a 36% increase in the risk of death. There's no significance in rural areas when we look at the sequence index generally across all people. But when we look specifically for black children, what, what we see is when we look at this nearest neighbor measurement, we do see um, an increase in the risk of experiencing um, death under five. And we see similarly only um, significance for black children um, when we look at proportion black in urban areas, although we know from other data that the risk of child death in urban areas was higher for black children than white children. Um, and this is our combined, and we see similar trends here as well. But the overall takeaway from this work um, is that we see the same general story using these measures, right? Child mortality higher for, for black children than white children. However, when we look at more 
nuanced measures of segregation, specifically um, our sequence index of segregation, we see an increase in the likelihood of child mortality when we look at this neighborhood experience of segregation versus these spatial measures. Um, and I feel like I'm a few minutes over, but um, using this historical, um, using historical demography to kind of document the potential impact and persistence of structural racism, I think is what this paper attempts to demonstrate. Um, and thank you to the Minnesota Population Center and IPAMS and ISRD and all the wonderful people who provided feedback on this work. All right, one more paper to go here. Um, I get to uh, introduce uh, Jenny Van Hook. Uh, Jenny is a Roy C. Buck Professor of Sociology and Demography at the Pennsylvania State University and a non-resident fellow at the Migration Policy Institute. Her research focuses on the demographics of the immigrant populations and the socioeconomic integration of immigrants and their children. First of all, I just wanna say how thrilled I am to be here and I was so happy to be asked. I've been a huge cheerleader for IPAMS all of these years. Um, I use IPAMS, I think it's fair to say every week, at least once a week, I am on the website, I am checking it. Whenever I meet with my students, I'm saying, it'll come up and they'll say, oh, can I learn about this? And I say, well, let's go look. And we look at IPAMS and it's a huge source, not just for data, but for documentation. Um, and I love those charts where you can see across all the years, whether a variable is in there and where it is. What was that? With case counts. With case counts. Oh my goodness. Yes. So I, you know, yay, <laughs> this is so great. Um, and it just makes the huge makes a huge difference. I mean, and 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 in the field of immigration research, I, I study immigrant integration, and there is been there has been huge advances due to the work that uh, and the data that IPAMS provides. Um, one of the things that we often talk about, and there's like the theory and development of ideas about immigrant integration often include the sort of implicit comparison of today's immigrants with the industrial era immigrants, with this idea being that, oh, the industrial era immigrants, they succeeded, why can't today's immigrants succeed? And um, and I'm not saying everybody is saying it like that, but a lot of those kinds of um, ideas about that now and then comparison is being made in, in the context of a data vacuum. And, and I think only just recently with the innovations, not only with the harmonization of census data, but also the innovative new um, data linkages that are just now coming forth <laughs> has accelerated um, empirically based research on immigrant integration. And so I'm hoping to be able to present some of this for you today. So. So I, actually, we should have talked before <laughs> because I am going to be talking about ethnic identity and how it's related to our assessment today of educational disadvantages that we see for Mexican-Americans. So um, I'd like to thank the Russell Sage Foundation for funding this work. Um, also, I've worked extensively with Census Bureau um, and the RDC network um, to do this research. And then, of course, IPAMS, and, and IPAMS actually played a huge role in the development of the data that I use for this. And this is the, the CLIP data, which is um, starting with the 1940 census. They were involved in um, putting the, the personal identifiers on, on the 1940 census, which then enables me to link the 1940 data to um, current census survey and survey data. So, yay. Okay, so I'm gonna start with this, um, just um, this comes from the CPS and this is a very common pattern that you see among Mexican Americans is that the educational attainment seems to be slow. And um, so this is for the first generation and uh, uh, half of them have a less than a high school degree. Um, huge improvements by the second generation and that makes sense because now um, most of the second generation grew up in the United States, had access to U.S. schools. Um, but then the problem comes about when you look at the third generation, this is the third or higher, not much change between the second and the third. And then they also fall short of what you see among um, U.S.-born whites. 
And so a lot of it has been made of this. It's often called third generation decline. I guess I would say this is third generation um, de delay, you know, um, stagnation. Some people have called it, this is, was prominent in the NAS report that came out, Mary Waters' work on that. Um, and so a lot of it has been made of this. And so the question is, how are we to understand this persistent inequality? Um, so uh, sociology provides um, some guideline here when we think about the Wisconsin status attainment model, and it has a lot to do with family processes. Um, and um, starting points, like what is the educational attainment of your parents? And increasingly there's more research even on the grandparents' education, how much does that matter? Um, and so maybe one group has different um, background than a different group. So maybe that's it. There's also a lot of research on opportunity structures. And here, you know, there's been tremendous um, um, investment in public schooling over the 20th century, and um, that makes a huge difference. Um, unfortunately, for a lot of Mexican American families, especially growing up in Texas, um, the access to schooling was much worse, and so they were not able to um, gain access to the same opportunities that other groups did. And so, for example, we know like for a lot of the industrial era immigrants who were living in the Northeast, um, access to public schooling kind of broke that relationship with the parents' education. It really weakened the effects of family in terms of how far they could go in school. So maybe it's unequal opportunity. And then a third idea is demography. <laughs> and here we're really talking at the macro level. and um, Really, um, there are certain processes that have um, a lot to do with whether the less educated subgroup of a population grows faster than the more educated subgroup. And um, one um, mechanism is fertility, un unequal fertility. And um, Rob Mayer, um, Shi Song, both of them had developed models and augmented sort of the idea of the status attainment model to account for unequal fertility. But then also uh, Brian Duncan and Steve Trejo, Trejo who we just learned about, um, also talk about changes in ethnic identity and how that's correlated with educational attainment. So that groups um, with more educational attainment are less likely to identify as uh, Mexican American, even if they have ancestry. And, um, and so then those groups tend to um, lose population over time. And it's not because of fertility differences, it's just because they're being lost statistically in, in, in the data. So our approach here, well, first of all, I'll just explain kind of what we're doing here. Um, our approach here is to, first of all, we write a big equation. <laughs> and what we're doing is we're expressing third generational educational attainment as a function of all of these factors starting points, um, the, the production of the second generation from those starting points, um, and that's a function of early fertility, early mobility, early ethnic attrition. And then also the same thing for the third generation. And so we start with the first and then to go to the second and then to the third. And it results in this really ugly um, equation here. Um, and I'm not gonna go through that. And then we take that equation and we actually estimate that for both Mexican Americans and then non-Hispanic whites and decompose then the differences between the two groups into these components. And um, we can make it all add up, not quite. So there's an interaction <laughs> at the end of it. Um, so it's a standard sort of decomposition analysis. Um, so how do we actually get the data to do this? This is our data project. So. We use the CLIP data, which starts with the 1940 census, and we link those records to CPS and ACS data. Um, let's see. Um, let's see. I don't think I need to go into all of this. Um, basically, here's a picture of kind of what we do. So we might have um, immigrant family um, in the 1940 census. We take their children and we follow them into adulthood in the CPSs. And then we follow their children or the grandchildren of the original generation into the 
um, 2000 census or ACS. So we end up with a third, three generational um, data set. Um, we also have a number of two generation families, which really helps with our sample sizes. Um, so those are them. And here's our sample sizes. And then here's um, the numbers of Mexican immigrants. You can see how we have 56,000 two generation and then only 400,000 third generation. And this is a problem. And um, it's because we have this bottleneck with the CPS. So when the 1960, 70 censuses are picked, then I'm gonna be able to actually um, improve on this. So that would be my wish list, right? <laughs> Um, okay, so one of the nice things about this um, is this point here is that ethnic identity here is separate from um, ethnic origin. So ethnic origin here is the per, is based on the place of birth of that first generation. Um, so if any of those people in the first generation, any of the four grandparents are born in Mexico, then they're classified as Mexican origin but then their ethnic identity is measured separately in the CPS, the census or the ACS. Um, we only are able to follow families who live here. So if they went back to Mexico, we do not catch them. Um, and we do have a, some amount of match bias, but surprisingly it's not that large. So, and we, we do try to adjust for it. It doesn't make any difference. Great, thanks. Um, Okay, just disclosures. And so I'm just going to kind of wipe work through this first. So when we look at the starting points of the parents in the first generation and back in 1940, you can see just how vast the differences were in educational attainment of the parents. Um, um, yeah. Um, so like about half of the US born white parents went to high school or graduated from high school compared to 13% of Mexican American parents. Um, inequality was also um, present in the mobility process. So if we just look at um, children of parents with zero to eight years of education and in the second generation, um, there's large differences between whites and Mexican Americans in, in um, the attendance of high school. Um, so you can see that there. Um, and then, um, but for the third generation, there's much more equality than, than we see for the second generation. So again, we're able to kind of, this is sort of the, the, the one on the right is sort of post civil rights era. The one on the left is pre civil rights era. And so there's, there was a dramatic change over time. So, um, okay, fertility is also higher among um, women with less schooling. Um, so you can see that there, especially with that. Um, if you look at the Mexican American women, I think this, the the, cur the 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 slope is pretty strong. So like um, for women with zero to eight years of education, had five children on average, were less than two among those who went to college. But there weren't that many who went to college, so um, maybe this doesn't matter so much, and we'll see in a sec. So. Um, Okay, ethnic change is also very highly associated with educational attainment. And so, for example, if we look at, um, this is the third generation in the, in the orange line there. Uh, among those who had zero to eight years of schooling, um, in, uh, all along the, the gradient there, you can see um, about 72% um, identify as Mexican American, even if they had at least one grandparent who was born in Mexico. And this just gets um, less and less as we go to higher levels of schooling. So the, for those who finished college, it was less than half, it was 40%. And so there's just a very, very high amount of ethnic attrition going on here. So um, how much do these explain current differences in educational attainment? Um, there's a nine point gap in finishing high school and there's a 17 point gap in college completion. Um, here's what we find. Um, so let's see, this is, these are the disadvantages in high school completion. Um, you can see the nine point gap there at the end on the far left. Most of it has to do with inequality and mobility. 
And so that um, the green part of that bar has to do with the early years of mobility between the first and second generation. The yellow is between the second and the third generation. Um, nevertheless, there is a very large share of this difference that has to do with ethnic change. So about a third of the disadvantage is due to that. Um, if we look at college, it's even more likely to be ethnic change, almost half of the, of the difference. But um, yeah, so um, yeah. So our conclusions, um, uh, yes, educational attainments for Mexican-Americans are pretty low. These disadvantages are rooted in history. Um, about half to two thirds of it has to do with um, low opportunities, especially between the first and the second generation. Um, although some of it continues now. Um, at least a third of it though is related to ethnic change. And this is where I guess we have to push back and say, why are people change, you know, being less likely to say that they're um, Mexican American when given the opportunity to respond that way? And why is it more common among those with a college degree? Um, anyway, so this is obscuring our understanding of their mobility over time. Um, let's see, starting points really don't matter that much because it gets um, kind of wiped away by the patterns of intergenerational mobility. And so, you know, to some degree, I don't, if I had more time, I could go on about this, but it, it might say something about how we think about who we admit as immigrants today and how important things like public charge rules are um, for understanding the long-term prospects for immigrants. Um, and very, very little of this has to do with fertility differences. 